Hi everyone, I'm Emily. And I'm Rebecca. And now that you're familiar with solitary tunnel nesting bees, we can actually go over how to care for them yourselves. And if you didn't catch our first video, make sure you watch that one first. First, you will need to pick a bee house and a place to hang it. Optimal location would be six to seven feet off the ground, protected from weather with south or southeastern sun exposure. Bees are ectothermic. This means they do not regulate their body temperature the same way that we do. In order to fly, their temperatures must reach about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. They can do this by warming in the sun or by vigorously vibrating their flight muscles. Morning sun exposure will allow them to start foraging earlier in the day without needing to expend extra energy. We recommend hanging your nest under the eaves of your house. If this is not an option, choose a house design that provides adequate shelter from the elements on its own. These can be hung somewhere like a tree or a fence post. Bee houses range from simple PVC pipes to expertly designed wooden or ceramic enclosures of varying shapes. Next, you'll need to equip your bee house with nesting tubes or trays. Many people use solid wooden houses with drilled holes for nesting. This type of habitat does not allow cocoons to be harvested, and there tends to be significant buildup of debris and disease in the holes after being used for multiple seasons. We recommend selecting nesting tubes or blocks that can be opened. Harvesting, cleaning, and storing your cocoons at the end of the season is the best way to ensure bee health and populations for the next year. A variety of nesting tubes can be used. Some options include natural reeds, cardboard tubes with or without a paper insert, or any rigid and breathable material like printer paper rolled around a pencil and fastened with tape. Providing tubes with a range of diameters is the best way to provide habitat for the widest range of native bees and beneficial wasp species. Once cocoons are harvested, however, tubes will need to be replaced. Alternatively, you can choose to provide your bees with wooden nesting trays. These are easily open for cocoon harvest and can be cleaned and reused for years to come. Nesting blocks and tubes can be provided interchangeably and can be mixed and matched inside the enclosure. Your next consideration will be forage and nesting materials. Make sure your bees have everything they need within their 300 foot foraging radius. When adding bee forage to your habitat, keep in mind that the best plants are native plants. Native bees have spent hundreds of thousands of years co-evolving with native plants. Thus, they are best at collecting pollen and nectar from these types of flowers. These bees are generalist foragers, meaning they gather nectar and pollen from many types of flowers. Make sure you provide a variety of plants with staggered blooming periods. This will ensure they have forage throughout the season. Lastly, we recommend avoiding hybrid plants. These tend to produce less nectar and pollen and will not provide a good quality diet for your bees. Visit local nurseries and check out the plant list from Xerces Society to find out the best plants for your area and what will work for native pollinators in your neck of the woods. Next, you'll need to make sure your bees have adequate nesting materials available to seal up development chambers within the tubes. Mason bees require mud with a heavy clay texture. If this is not naturally occurring in your area, you can purchase dry clay mud, mix it, and put it out for your bees. They are sensitive to the moisture level of the mud, so be sure to water it frequently. Leaf cutter bees require leafy or petal material to cut and bring back to the nest. They seem to prefer pea plants, roses, lilacs, and dahlias. The next step is to get bees. You can purchase cocoons for blue orchard mason bees and alfalfa leaf cutter bees. These are among the most common species available through breeders and nurseries. We get our cocoons from crown bees in Seattle, Washington. Alternatively, you can attract local bees to your nesting site with nest scent pheromones. These are most often available in the form of cotton sheets infused with cocoon dust. You can try both methods at the same time. Simply providing cocoons will help draw local bees to the aggregation. Mason bee cocoons can be released when temperatures reach above 50 degrees Fahrenheit consistently in your area. Place them on a ledge near the habitat or in a design space within the bee house, like an attic. Adult bees will emerge conveniently near an ideal nesting site and are very likely to move in. We recommend releasing your cocoons in two waves. The first when optimal temperatures are reached and the second about two weeks later. This will help increase your pollination efficiency and increase your yields. Males are smaller than females and emerge first. 
they forage for nectar and return to the nesting site to await females. Before releasing portions of your population, make sure you have a good ratio of small to large cocoons to ensure your females have enough males to mate with. You can begin leafcutter bee aggregations in the same manner later in the season. Release cocoons when temperatures reach a consistent 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Once everything is set up and your bees are active, they will take care of themselves entirely for the rest of the season. Mason bee season is over when tunnels are capped with mud. This usually happens by early summer. You can choose to move capped and sealed tubes into a protective and breathable bag to prevent predation and parasitism. Store these in a warm location where they will not be disturbed. Otherwise, leave sealed tubes in place and undisturbed until fall cocoon harvest. While your bees may be totally fine on their own, the best way to actually prevent parasites and disease from spreading is to harvest and clean your cocoons at the end of season. To harvest, simply open the tubes or nesting blocks and scrape out the nesting materials. Then sort the cocoons from the debris. Be sure to do this in a cool place. You do not want your bees to wake up early after being moved into a warm house. Any C-shaped cocoons should be separated and discarded immediately. These likely contain a fungal spore disease called chalk root. Chalk root can spread readily and affect your other bees. Wash the cocoons in a cold water bath. If any chalk root was found, add bleach to kill the fungal spores. A quarter cup of bleach per one gallon of cold water will suffice. Any cocoons that sink in the bath should also be separated and discarded. Keep an eye out for cocoons with small holes. These may have been parasitized by wasps and should remain separate from healthy bees. Cocoons can be stored in the refrigerator between 30 and 40 degrees Fahrenheit and should be maintained in an enclosure around 60 to 70% humidity. Crown Bee's Humidity Bee is a container specifically designed for this purpose. Cocoons can be stored like this through the winter until temperatures break 50 degrees consistently the next season. At that point, they can be placed outside near their nest to begin another season. Leafcutter bees will remain active until late fall. Once you stop seeing active adults, remove their nesting blocks or tubes and place them in a breathable bag. Store them in a cool location, like a shed, basement, or garage through the winter. Leafcutter bee cocoons can be harvested in early spring when adult mason bees are starting to wake up. Separate cocoons from debris, store them in a breathable bag in a warm place, but make sure you don't wash leafcutter bee cocoons because they are not waterproof. Four weeks before your summer garden begins to bloom, place your cocoons in a location with consistent warm temperatures of around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. This allows them to pupate and your adult bees should be ready to emerge in about 28 days when they can be placed outside near the nesting site. Overall, increasing native bee populations is one of the best ways to support local ecosystems and increase your garden and fruit tree yields. Keeping mason and leafcutter bees and providing habitat and forage for other native bees is an easily attainable and rewarding experience you will not want to miss out on. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe to catch all of our latest updates and go on over to beethinking.com if you're ready to purchase your own mason bee house.